Please listen carefully. This is really awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me, Roanoke. Who's from Roanoke? Okay, so I'm not alone in the fact that I'm not from here. Who knows Richmond, Virginia? RBA? So I don't have my slides, but I live this stuff every day, so I can speak to you very easily from the heart. And I want to first introduce you to where field notes from the front line actually came from. So this is hot off the press. They don't line up so well because I cut them myself. This is one of the things that you do when you don't have a team that you can rely on to do things. They don't fix your slides. <laughs> they don't make sure that they run before you get there. They don't pack your belt and things like that. Um, there's realities that come with being able to bring something from the mind to the people. And there's not always resources to do that because there's no one that's actually saying, hey, we're paying you to fulfill this mission. And the field notes from the front line story starts, I think I'll probably begin it from uh, 2013. No, excuse me, I'll go back to 2010. So in Richmond, Virginia, um, we're known anyway from the 1800s uh, as the capital of the Confederacy. I'm sure you all are familiar. But um, the Civil War ended in Richmond, Virginia in 1865 on April 3rd. Um, so my family is from the oldest free black community in the United States. It's right outside Richmond in Petersburg. It's called Pocahontas Island, which my mother didn't tell me anything about. I had to kind of find out on my own. And so living in Richmond, growing up in Richmond and stuff, um, I just had this real interest in why my AP history classes and things didn't include black stuff, you know? So when it came time for me to go to college, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to a black school, whatever, this is just no more of this, you know, unbiased education. So fast forward to uh, 2013, I now have uh, two daughters, I think one was graduated high school, one was about to graduate high school, and then one was about six at the time. And in Richmond, like I said, we were going through this reclamation of this African ancestral burial ground, which had been found, and really is up under 95 when you drive through 95. And so I was one of the people that was down there saying, yeah, we need to lay in front of the cars and not let VCU's vehicles park on top of our ancestors. The phrase that I coined was, don't take, take your asphalt off of our ancestors. And it was just like, you know, we, it was a, a victory of the people. But then I began to see how the narrative was being shifted away from the victory of the people to things that the media was actually kind of looping into the way they wanted to present the information. And I realized history was something that we were actually living now. So in 2013, we have this uh, startup competition called Feast, and you spend $25, you buy a ticket, you come to Feast, and three people are able to present their amazing idea about how they want to uh, in, invest their energy into building a better Richmond. And I presented Untold RVA, which I didn't bring any, but anyway, normally you'll see me with an Untold RVA logo right here on my lanyard, which I wear every day. And today I was actually able to change that for the first time and put field notes from the front line. So anyway, um, Untold RVA is the people's choice for the creative advancement of Richmond's most powerful self-determination narratives that are hidden in plain sight. And I began to just go to community conversations. And that's where field notes really begins, the story begins began to go to community conversations, and it was rooms just like this. And they would be put on by different nonprofit organizations or the city. They would have consultants come in. The consultants are paid $200,000. How do I know this? Because I was always digging deeper than the average person in the audience that wanted to attend these, these forums. But I'm going to these things, and like I'm noticing that there's different people that are intersecting in uh, the community in different ways about these hidden historical narratives or preserving our ancestors or, you know, um, elevating the history of the past uh, in the uh, Civil War era and the enslavement era. And I'm noticing three things. 
Number one, the people who are reporting on this are using language that is not the language that I or any of my immediate peer group would be using. For instance, we don't say slaves, we say enslaved because a slave is a person that has stopped fighting. That's how we understand it to be. Our ancestors and our elders and those who have um, come through our uh, community you know, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, people that we really get our direct inspiration from taught us that you are not a slave, honey. You ain't no slave. And so we were like, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, it means that you haven't stopped fighting. Um, you, your ancestors were enslaved. So that was a language um, touch point that if you heard a person say it like that, you knew, okay, they down, you know. But if they didn't, and they kept on. So like, I would find myself saying to, you know, the media outlets when they would put the microphone and say, free, what do you have to say? And I would say one thing, but it would come up totally different in the media. And I was like, dang, man, you know, like, you didn't hear me say, you know, this or that. Or for instance, we would say, um, we would say the African Ancestral Burial Ground. That's another one that I specifically advocated for. It's like my own personal you know, um, introduction into the community, a collective knowledge base is to call the African Ancestral Burial Ground, which was reclaimed from VCU as a parking lot, but that was there from the early 1800s. I would say the African Ancestral Burial Ground, and then it would go back in as the slave burial ground. Ne no, old, old Negro burial ground. I didn't say anything like that. When was the last time you called somebody a Negro? So, <laughs> curses, you know? And like, it would keep coming up and keep coming up. So finally I was like, man, I gotta do something to control this narrative. So that's when, in 2013, I decided to found um, Untold RVA, and I entered into this uh, startup competition and was democratically elected by about 75 people in that room, which was all creatives, maker-doers, um, folks that really wanted to see a more, um, uh, a thinker's Richmond emerge. Um, and they supported it, I unanimously won. Um, I think not unanimously, I will say that they had more votes for Untold RVA that day than they had ever had for the votes between three different ways. And so I was like, boom, you know, the creative community, we could do this, all right, boom. So the next thing, I had all these designers come and they were like, free, man, you're, because I did a slideshow. That's exactly how I ended, because. I have design thinking as my, um, and that's why I wish you could see my slides because I'm, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not trained as a designer from college, but I'll tell you how that actually happened. Get the heck out of here. You got my slides? Jiminy Christmas. What? I love y'all. I can't even believe it. Oh, God. All right, calm down, Wusa. All right. So I can go back. All right, so Egun Field Notes from the Front Line, established today. Uh, this is the first time the world has ever seen. So my friend, the designer um, from Richmond, uh, hooked this up. I told her what I needed. She's like, I'm doing too much. You just got to put this together for me. So this is how she translated. I always say, may it be so, which in the African ancestral uh, language of my uh, ancestors, the Yoruba, it's ashe. And so um, I always put may it be so on things because now everyone is saying ashe, which means the life force, the energy of uh, synergistic thinking and um, just as all things come together for good, you say ashe, you can say it, ashe. See, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, that's what I'm saying. All right, that just made my day. So field notes from the front line. So my ancestors, um, my last name is Egun Femi. It's a reclaimed last name. My ancestors come from the southwestern part of Nigeria. This is um, something that was divined. I'm in the um, African traditional uh, religion of um, Yoruba. It's a spiritualist thing. My uh, triple great grandmother was uh, a spiritualist, and my great grandmother actually used a crystal ball and a magic wand to see me before I was born. She's the one that made the slides pop up. Say thank you, Grandma. <laughs> she saw all of this. Did I, oh my God, and I just looked back there and it said 1111, and so that's my number, you'll see it in my slides. Um, I, it says 1102 now, but a second ago it said 1111, so I need you to know, she's here. Anyway, um, that's my little girl, that's Ngozi, when she was born, uh, the prophecy was like, look, you gotta have another kid, I'm sorry, you know, she's in there actually right now. I was like, what, no way, went home, I was pregnant. And they said she has to learn everything that you know, so keep her close. That's my two daughters on the end, the ones that were 23 and they're 23 and 22 now. So my grandma, 
It's my mom, she's passed over, and that's Ngozi over there in the back at our family house. So, okay, so like I said, we started this story a little roundabout, but it really basically um, speaks from the fact that I started all this building ancestor altars over all over the damn place in Richmond, and that's one. Um, that's the one when my mom transitioned. I was able to build that one for her. Um, when my mother passed away, I put her ashes, I interred her ashes in the African Ancestral Burial Ground in Richmond, and that's my daughter and I um, wrapping the tree with her favorite colors um, on Ancestor Day. All this ancestor stuff that I was doing in the community really didn't have any outward facing expectation at first. I was just doing things to build up myself, my family, my community. These um, reclaimed spaces, this is uh, the African burial ground. It actually used to be a parking lot. You see the lights there? Um, it's because it used to be a VCU parking lot and we laid our bodies in front of the cars until eventually it was reclaimed and now there's limited resources to take care of it and I pay to get the grass cut out of my own household budget, put signage up, I work in tactical urbanism, placemaking, wayfinding, I design things, put wheat paste stuff up just to make sure that everyone knows what they're looking at and even have an audio software package that I use to, I have a telephone number that you can call when you go down there and each sign is actually enhanced with something that I coined the phrase called a pod marker and it basically allows you to listen to a little podcast information of like all the left out pieces of the historical record. Am I louder for some reason? Okay, let me. All right, so moving on. Oops. Yeah, so like I said, everybody started asking me, free, free, you know, what do you think? This is one of those scenarios where they got the whole story wrong. I was like, I gotta get in front of this. So, VCU started calling, free, can you get on these panels? Well, I mean, at the time, it's like, okay, you know, and I'd be killing it. But I always made sure to put the red, black, and green there because to me, that's the red for the blood of the people, the passion that drives our culture. The black is for black, black power, black excellence, black magic. Uh, and then the green is for the connection to the earth and all people that respect the earth, no matter what their particular background might be. We also got the Richmond Times Dispatch picking stuff up all the time. That's my friend Kelly, who uh, produces for NPR, and she did a story for me on, about me and this uh, underground railroad tunnel that I found in Shaco Bottom, which is in Richmond. And um, it was on All Things Considered, 40 million listens the first day. My PBS special that she produced came out, 20 million shares within, no, 20,000 shares, excuse me, um, within like the first month. So it was like the platforms kept getting bigger and bigger. This is us, um, we received a $20,000 grant this year from the Ovation Network to set something up called Storefront Studio, which is a place that uh, you can actually use audio equipment and uh, they, we basically bought seven Zoom recorders and stuff to encourage people to be able to collect narratives and we'll be here with my team from Field Notes from the Front Line and Storefront Studio to speak with some of you so that we can actually record the things that you're answering to very pivotal questions um, about this kind of work and put this into a database that University of Richmond built for me. And that is going to go into the historical record because I really feel that if these oral histories that people are collecting as a buzzword in the world, if they're really not preserved properly, and if we don't source and give credit to folks when they come up with these brilliant observations, then these things are going to just fade. And um, audio and oral very well might be um, in field notes format might actually be sometimes more valuable than what you can get from a book because a lot of people just don't write, but they say brilliant things and they need to be preserved. So Ovation believed in that and they funded Storefront Studio. University of Richmond began to actually call me and say, look, we, we have 10 students, we'll pay you a gazillion dollars, and <laughs> to me it was a gazillion dollars this summer, and you have 10 weeks and you can teach them exclusively whatever it is that you need them to know. Um, and I was like, this came from the uh, archival activism, uh, race and racism archive at University of Richmond. And uh, they had me speaking there. I spoke with their students. They did like a campus community partnership. I started this thing called uh, Communiversity. It's com.university. Um, and it'll tell you more about that. Um, and uh, I taught them the three key elements of Untold RVA, which is intersectionality. Uh, resistance and self-determination. So self-determination as a principle of untold RVA and field notes is the power of being able to um, do what you were born to do no matter what. 
It's just that simple, self-determination. It also comes from the Kwanzaa, um, collect, you know, the, the language from Kwanzaa, the Kiswahili language. Um, it's the second day of Kwanzaa, the 27th of December, and that's Kuji Chagalia, self-determination. Um, so the second principle of untold RVA and uh, field notes is um, intersectionality. And that basically means who did you work with uh, in the lens of history? Who did these people, who did these narratives work together with that were unexpected, but the things that they were able to accomplish, they were accomplishing because of them working together. And then resistance, meaning what did you push past no matter what was thrown at you? What were the, the boundaries and barriers? So like, I don't know if you know about Nat Turner or if you know about Gabriel, uh, I could say Brother General Gabriel, I don't use their last names because they're uh, the names of their captors, their human captors. Um, but they, a lot of people say that there were failed uh, insurrections or failed, but I know that if you have a lens that's a little bit shifted in the favor of the people, um, then you'll know that it inspired me, so how could it be a failure if it expires, inspires him or her? How can it be a failure? So that language is really important to reclaim, and that's a key part of Untold RVA. Um, the VMFA was calling. They were like, free, free, we want you to talk and do this and that. Um, this is another, I think this is um, some department at VCU. Um, oh, then suddenly, like, Thousands of people are like, free, free, be the keynote. So I'm like, okay. I mean, really, coming from someone who did not graduate college, who has three children, who had to put everything on hold, who had a food stamp card in her pocket, and everyone's free, free, what do you think? It was a big deal. And I was just like, this is way bigger than free, free. How am I going to make this replicable? How can I interrupt the way that um, so many nonprofit organizations and so many different city agencies will call for what they think is very um, innovative with this, let's have a community conversation. Pack the room, listen to what people say, get the community's ideas and input. But meanwhile, all that brilliance is going into their strategic planning meetings. It's not being credited. The intellectual property is being um, usurped from the people. It's being shifted away from what they originally intended. and. You know, people have jobs as a result of it. They're getting these huge grants because of it. And I just couldn't tolerate those things happening. Um, I can't tell you how many people wrote stories about this Monument Avenue march that I keynoted at. And a lot of the things that were being said made very little reference to the fact that, you know, I was a driving factor in how this thing actually shaked out and stuff uh, with the women who organized it quite successfully. So I first said, okay, I gotta put my shingle out in the world, right? So I was like, all right, graphic design. At the time, like I didn't even have Photoshop, Illustrator, I was using all kind of crazy little programs and stuff. Cause that stuff costs a lot of money. You guys know the um, Adobe Suite is expensive. Where am I gonna get that kind of money from, you know? Um, I started doing tours, so I started stacking my cash. Um, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna just walk people around here for nothing, $25, um, 20 people, no overhead, I'll buy a computer, you know, and it started happening over and over. So I began to understand how to monetize the intellectual property that I had been able to accumulate from just taking time to study and read these stacks of books that no one, you know, ever read. My, my goal actually is to be able to know everything and more that Dr. Ed Ayers knows, who is the former president of University of Richmond, and um, he's a brilliant historian. I want him to write the foreword to my book. Speaking of which, the um, history press called and were like, free, free, can you please write a book for us? And I was like, what? Whoa, wait a minute, didn't you just publish like a lot of books for Ed Ayers and everybody else I admire and respect on my bookshelf? So um, that happened. And this is um, University of Richmond. Um, all their students, they paid them each $5,000 to, um, stay with me for 10 weeks all summer. All of them got paid. So can you imagine that boodles and oodles of money that they tossed my way that I was able to like do things and invest in other people with this summer? Um, yet another group at the African Burial Ground. So remember I told you about the 1111? So this is the 1111 portal. I began to build these tactical urbanism stations in the city where you could actually go there, think about what you would be doing in the future if you had ability to control that, spin these wheels that were made of reclaimed um, materials from the city, and, be, and project at the water's edge the future that you wanted to see for yourself and your loved ones. They're called 1111 portals. Folks ended up taking these pilgrimages all over the country um, to come to the 1111 portals. Then the uh, Richmond uh, 
when it said the um, Richmond Region Tourism was like, you know, she's doing her thing, let's put her in the guide so people can find her a little better. The, um, um, what is this, Free Press was then saying, okay, time for you to be the personality of the week, Free. And I was like, well, first, let's go down and let's see what the spirit world says about this. So we went down there and we spun. That's really all I wanted to do was build these, these ancestor altars in the city. But I realized in doing so, there was a real important piece that I wanted to open up the door for other black excellent contributors, creative content, um, content creators in our city, that they would actually be monetized in a way where their brilliance was actually leading to their health, stability, into the prosperity of their families, and that they wouldn't be um, really taken advantage of by those who actually um, know how to commodify uh, brilliant ideas. So the mayor tended to seem to gravitate towards me when I would be out and I said, well, it's time for us to go ahead and use those Zoom recorders and get us out there and start having conversations be recorded and become part of the historical record. And so that's at the Maggie Walker statue unveiling. And I found that it cost $700,000 to put up a statue in the honor of someone. So I thought the best thing to do was really start getting that tactical urbanism together. So um, I started doing wheat paste um, murals all over. And then the city kind of got wind of it and they were like, why are you putting these on our stuff? And they power washed them off and kept coming back and power washing them off again. So I, you know, Preservation Virginia asked me to come there and help them as a consultant. So that's where the consultancy thing was born. They said, help us figure out how we can now open up our, um, our demographic. Help us figure out how we're able to uh, serve the needs of the black community. And I said, well, the first thing is we are not a monolith and every black person is not going to be able to come because I said I was gonna help you do this. I think the best way that you can connect history and black folks is that you probably need to get to the black people that like going to thrift shops and dressing quirky and like being a hipster. And they were like, what do you mean, Free? That's crazy. I was like, no, it's not. These are the people that like old crap. I mean, they're gonna like going to the museum. It's, it's a no-brainer, so you know what I'm saying? It's one of those, it's one of those things, just think about it. Um, so I, I went to their um, sites of remembrance and I uh, was out there uncovering their lost narratives and finding things that they had never really focused on. Because once you get those people out there, you gotta tell them things that are gonna make them wanna tell their next group of friends that they should go out there also. And so, um, but one of the main things I said is that, you know what, I um, am an artist, I'm a creative person. This history stuff is really because it's connected to the ancestral remembrance and I really need to do research. So I started applying for um, research grants and different things like that. And I can honestly say that I haven't been rejected for any grants that I wrote um, since I started writing grants for this stuff. And I, I wanna talk to you guys about some things that you can do, uh, action steps that you can actually um, begin to support black excellence and begin to hold space for those who are uh, creative and outside of your own uh, cultural background and stuff. The first thing you should know is that I'm motivated by everything I do uh, because of my ancestors and this is something anyone can use. See 1111, how that's there yet again? Um, and I repeat this every day at 1111 if I see it on the clock. My ancestors love me. They're my first line of defense. They did good and I will do good too. And the reason being that they're your first line of defense is because they were living. Their stories are in the continuum. Um, you can concentrate on people, even if your bloodline is complete jerks, somebody along the way, whether it be, I mean, I don't even know, um, Audre Lorde or, you know what I mean, anybody who you feel connected to within the scope of your work. You should connect to them, read their stories. If you're a person that's into biographies and stuff, you're honoring ancestors, believe it or not. And so they did good too. You, they did good and we should do good too. This, oh, that's little free. And, um, that's me never um, having known that it was gonna come to all of this. And that's me at University of Richmond, um, opening up this space. And you know, there are a lot of people that will try to tell you that sh the ideas ain't shit. Um, don't believe it. <laughs> they really are gonna try to tell you, you haven't graduated, you, please, you got a felony, please. You're a girl, like how are you gonna compete with all these, you know, old boys club and stuff and it's, you don't have to believe that. Um, you can and you will, end of story. I don't try, I do. You don't try, you do. This is how all of this actually came to be. 
You don't even consider the fact that you failed because there is no failure. There's just, I'll fix it tomorrow and if I don't, someone after I die will continue in my work and I'm still on the winning team, right? That's how it goes. Um, so this is my contact information. I wanna make sure to leave you if you wanna take a uh, screenshot of it. Hit me up. I have some other pictures that didn't make it into this that are about Storefront Studio and Field Notes from the Front Line. But the way that I'm sending up Field Notes from the Front Line is that I've got five people that are subject matter experts in five different areas. And I'm going to set it up as a, um, starting in 2018, it's gonna be set up as a cohort. And for that first year, we're gonna put all these resources, they say in the innovation sector, it takes about three to $5,000 to actually toss at somebody who you want to invest in just to mitigate all kinds of just basic, you know, they need dental work, they've got a headache, they can't concentrate, or their tailpipe is falling off and you don't know if they're gonna get there, or they just like basically need to make sure their license is not suspended, or basic stuff that creative people put on the back burner because we're normally buying programs and typefaces and stuff like that. So you have to kind of invest in people. So the first thing is, with this $100,000 grant that's available, we're going to definitely um, invest about three to 5,000 in each of those five people. The second thing, we're going to make sure that we have um, work group sessions for people that are at level three and level four conversations of racial equity. Not the people that are like, no, what is white privilege again? Like, are you sure that race is really an issue? Not them, I'm talking about, <laughs> once you get done with that, I know you're probably sick of being in the room with those folks. Um, but once, you know, and, there's, and what I found is my friends that run Standing Up for Racial Justice or Showing Up for Racial Justice and um, Indivisible Richmond and Virginia Inclusive Communities Together We Will, Fan District Association, all these um, really woke white folks that I'm around all the time. Um, we're telling me, you know, free, like we don't know, we know that we don't want to be the colonizing imperialists of the you know, black excellence community. We don't want to come in there and like tell y'all what to do, but we don't know how to help. And I realize it's time to form field notes from the front line. So I'm doing this thing on the 20th, which is the first uh, one, but I'll be doing it several times in the year and I'd be glad to come and do it in your area. And uh, highlights five folks in your area or mine that are doing amazing things. And you actually come and hear them do a Pecha Kucha um, style slide presentation. And at the end, they'll tell you, look, this is what I need. We need Illustrator, we need you know, um, a, a storage unit, we need somebody to pick up the Panera, we need some money to buy the Panera for our meeting, or whatever, and then you can gravitate towards each one of those people and actually work on something that's already in motion rather than acting like you're creating some solution for the black community or people of color, because that's just not cool. So anyway, that's what Field Notes from the Front Line is doing. At the end of the year, once the um, emotional needs of post-traumatic slavery syndrome and frontline weariness um, has been mitigated by um, a lot of investment in our um, sustainability, then we'll be able to um, continue generating income from the intellectual uh, property of each one of the people in the cohort by actually um, setting up a speakers bureau. So if you wanted us to come and speak in your town and talk about um, each one of the five areas of expertise that each person handles, one um, is Hamilton Glass who does murals and deals with placemaking. One is Gina Lyles that deals with uh, kids and um, making sure to break the school to prison pipeline. One is uh, Rebecca Keel who deals with um, empowering political candidates so they can be ready for um, the voting season. And two others, a young man um, as well as Ilya Davis which is cooperative economics. But if you wanted to call any of us and at a price point we would be able to come. Or if you need us to come and sit down in your strategic planning session and you want to make sure you have the um, capacity to actually hear from someone boots on the ground. You can do all of these these things and it will actually help to balance out some of the, um, the uh, I hate to use the word robbery, but it is highway robbery when you take someone's ideas, monetize them, and don't even credit them for their intellectual property. It's just, it is what it is. So that's things that you can do with your power um, and your influence in the world. And I guess that's it. I'm free and this is my story. I'm sticking to it. Power to the people. May it be so. Peace.